Well, so glad you're joining us this morning. Uh, for me, growing up in a neighborhood with retired Nazi soldiers really changed the way I saw the world. It really did. I was just a normal Texas kid. Uh, I mean, I, I played ball in the street with my friends. I rode bikes in the neighborhood with my friends. I, I went to school. I, I went to church on Sundays with my family. I was a normal Texas kid. And then in the middle of fourth grade, a lot of you have heard my story. We moved to Stuttgart, Germany, from Texas across the Atlantic Ocean to Stuttgart, Germany. And uh, for the first time uh, in a big way, my eyes just got way bigger with the way I saw the world. I went to school on a military base. Uh, my parents weren't military, but all of my friends, for the most part, their parents were in the military. It was a European command base, which is really unique. So we had all four branches of the government, um, Army, Air Force, Marines, Navy. Uh, most of our folks were in the Army and the Air Force, it seemed. But I, that was my experience from all the way through middle school and high school. Uh, I learned how to play basketball after school in a gym, on Saturdays in a gym filled with 19, 20, 21 year old enlisted servicemen. Uh, I had coaches for my football team that were sergeants and captains and colonels. Uh, my world was around the military base, but because my parents weren't military, we lived off base. And so our neighbors were German citizens. Our neighbors were young German families that looked a whole lot like ours and, and, and kids my age, as well as some older German citizens, some of whom just three, three and a half decades earlier had served in the military in World War II under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. So that was a unique experience for me growing up over there. I got to wrestle at a very early age what it meant to live among people, <clears throat> at least some of them, who at one point were our enemies. It's a unique experience as a kid. As you can imagine, my fascination with World War II history just went off the charts. I really, really enjoyed it. I asked so many questions. I got to see things firsthand. Um, our family befriended a lot of Germans over the years, as you can imagine. And the older I got, I think the more fascinated I was with the history of our overlapping countries. In light of some very difficult words of Jesus that we're going to talk about today, my experience growing up over there as a kid uh, comes to mind for me. Let, let me bring it closer to home. When I was 23 years old, I had already moved back to Texas to go to college. I was a young adult. I had just gotten married, and I was living down in the outskirts of Houston, Texas with my new bride, and uh, I took a part-time job as a youth director at a United Methodist Church. Now, at the time, I had no plans to do this. I had no plans to work for a church, didn't want to work for a church, didn't want to work in a church. Uh, I was going to be a high school teacher, probably math. I was going to coach football and or basketball. My wife was already teaching. She finished college before me, so she was already, got, already got a job teaching high school math. Our little dream was to both teach in the same school, maybe have lunch together, certainly have you know spring break off together and Christmas off together and a summer off together and travel. We just had these great plans and dreams that did not include this crazy life of pastoring. Um, I was excited about that, but I, I got this part-time job along the way. Now, I grew up Baptist. I don't know what your background is religiously or in a certain church denomination. Uh, I grew up in a Baptist church, and so Methodists, I had, I had no clue about Methodists. I dated a girl in college who was a Methodist, but I'm not sure I learned anything about Methodism while we dated, okay? Uh, I do remember sitting down with the pastor of this Methodist church for the first time when I was thinking about this job. And we talked for almost an hour about the things that we probably disagreed on. Uh, his name was Dan, and Dan just led me through this conversation. But I'll never forget what he said after almost an hour. He said, but Lauren, we could talk for a couple of days straight about all the things we agree on, about who God is, about who Jesus is, about what he wants for us and for the world. And uh, I learned over time that he was right. We had a lot more in common than we had that was different. This was a temporary job. I wasn't dreaming about this long time anyway. It was part-time, so I dove in. I dove in. And in a different way, 
a different way than growing up in Germany with retired Nazi soldiers as my neighbors. Uh, this experience working in the Methodist church for a short time also changed the way that I saw the world. I mean, early on, there was a bunch of things that jumped out to me that were really different. The pastors wore robes, uh, which I didn't even know what to think about that. I was very nervous. I had to wear a robe. They wouldn't let me wear a robe anyway because I wasn't ordained in the Methodist church. But that was different. Uh, we all went forward uh, during our times of worship uh, for communion, which we also do here at Colonial, but we'd never done that in the church that I grew up in. So we all went forward and then we knelt down at an altar and the pastors in robes would serve us communion. And it was really weird and uncomfortable to me at first. I remember the first time this happened, this really freaked me out. We all stood and we recited from memory creeds and, and prayers that evidently these people had been saying for years and it turns out been saying for centuries. I'm the, the youth director. I work there and I have no idea what's going on. It was just so new for me. Um, I was suddenly put in charge of something called confirmation. I don't know if any of you out there have been confirmed. You went through something called confirmation. I'd never even heard of confirmation as a Baptist kid. For Catholics and Episcopalians and Methodists and, and a bunch of different, more of the high church traditions, this is a really important a milestone or a rite of passage for teenagers in their spiritual journey. I didn't know what it was, but I was the youth director. So all of a sudden I'm in charge of confirmation. There was all these weird things that, that were different for me. I ended up working in the Methodist church for four years. Uh, I will say this, my understanding of the church of Jesus, the capital C church of Jesus, I'm not talking about the local expression of colonial or the local expression of that Methodist church or that other church, the, the church with a capital C it just got so much bigger for me in that time of my life. It got so much more beautiful to me in that time of my life. I encountered people who were very different than me on the outside. They were Methodists. They had these different traditions, and they loved Jesus. And it just blew my mind, and it, it, really, it really just, I think, caused me to grow up in some important ways. One of my favorite pastors, arguably my favorite pastor that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with some really, really cool pastors over the years, this guy named Bob Shield. And he was at one of these two Methodist churches I worked at. Bob passionately loved Jesus. Bob was all about his own personal growth, his own um, spiritual practices, because he really believed the way he led, the way he served people was going to flow out of his own transformation. That made a big impact on me. Um, and maybe bigger than anything else, I watched Bob be a, a non-anxious presence in the midst of crisis, in the midst of difficult situations, difficult people, difficult circumstances. And that really stuck with me. That was 25 plus years ago. And that's really impacted me. So much to be grateful for uh, about that experience. But there was one experience I had in the Methodist church that was really hard, if I'm honest. That little Methodist church brought on a new associate pastor while I was there. And her name was Sharon. Uh, I was 23. I had grown up in this kind of church culture, this Baptist church culture that was led by men almost entirely. And a female pastor? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> really threw off 23-year-old Lauren. And it got crazier. Sharon was from Chicago. She had a very different life experience than I did. Um, she approached Scripture very differently. She believed much of the Old Testament part of Scripture uh, is allegory. Uh, it's figurative. It's not meant to be taken literally. And man, we went round and round about this. Within, within a pretty short time frame of us starting to work together, we had arguments with each other. I was very obnoxious. I was very confident in what I believed at 23. And, and we just did a lot of this about Scripture. She was also very outspoken about her belief in a woman's right to choose abortion which blew my mind. It blew my mind that my partner in ministry here, a pastor at our church, here in the Bible Belt of all places, uh, was pro-choice, and she was open about that. Uh, it really bothered me. How could we work together? <laughs> How could we lead and serve in a church together? How could we disagree about some things that were extremely important to me, evidently extremely important to her. How could we disagree about these things and still lead people to God, still lead people to Jesus, 
still faithfully serve in a God-honoring way. On top of all that, how could we be friends working together every day on a small team? How could we be friends? I remember some really hard conversations with Sharon. I remember, I remember frustrating the heck out of her. I remember her frustrating the heck out of me. Um, I remember wishing I could take back some things I said to her. Uh, maybe more, more importantly, some, some ways I spoke to her. I think I wish I could, I wish I could take that back. I, did, I would say we, we did come to form some kind of friendship with some mutual respect in the short time we were together, uh, but it was really hard for me, if I'm honest. On a side note, um, this, I'm going to step aside from our teaching. I want to come back to that, but I would be remiss, if I'm going to mention this idea of Sharon and the difficulty it was for me, I would be remiss not to talk about women in leadership for a moment. Uh, women in leadership in the church of Jesus has become an increasingly big deal to me. Um, the older I get, the more I read, uh, the more I study the scripture, the more I experience life, the more I encounter people with all kinds of gifts and contributions to the kingdom of God, the more convinced I am that you ladies have a ton to offer. And I want to confess my sin right now. I have been one of the men, at least in my little part of the world, that has held you back. And I'm sorry for that. Uh, and I, I hope you've heard me say half a dozen times already in my first couple years that this is something I want us to talk about, I want us to wrestle with. Uh, so I hope this is not out of left field and surprising any of you. I'm excited about what God's going to do in us and through us, specifically with our women and leadership. So mark my words, we are going to be inching forward and, and really working hard to see what are some formal, tangible opportunities that you ladies can step into leading us here at Colonial. Uh, men, it's going to get a little uncomfortable. Women, I hope that it's stretching for you as well. And we just listen for what God's saying. And we work together toward pleasing him and serving him faithfully and just letting God's grace pour over. So side note, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go on without saying that, but what is my experience growing up in a neighborhood with retired Nazi soldiers have to do with what we're talking about today? What is my experience uh, working with and, and trying to befriend Sharon, uh, a Methodist pastor, what, what does that have to do with what we're talking about today? Well, we've been talking the past few weeks about the battle between love and fear. And we kind of turned a corner last week uh, and we started to talk about how we live this out, how we actually live out this idea, this truth that love from the Lord is what he wants for us, not fear. So I feel like last week was almost part one of a new aspect of the conversation. Today's a little bit part two follow-up. What do we do with people we disagree with? What do we do with people we really strongly disagree with, maybe don't like? Well, remember, if our only choice is between attacking or running away, we have been polarized. If those are our only choices, we've been polarized, and the way of Jesus is neither. Flat out is neither. We talked about this last week. You and I have a very natural response. When things get difficult, when things get hard, when people get difficult, we, we kind of come to one of two things. We come to fight or flight. Uh, we're all familiar with this fight or flight response in us. It's very instinctive. Uh, fight is, is attacking. It's going after. It's, whether it's, it's verbally or it's on social media, whatever it is, we push back. Or some of us, we choose flight. We just stay away. We just pretend that's not happening. I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm just going to stay away over here and, and run away and stay away. And both of these responses are very natural. They're natural. It's instinctive. It's, it's what we do. But I want to remind you today, we've talked about this for a few weeks. It's, it's, a, it's a truth I want to keep hammering into you. I want to hammer into me and really embrace this truth. To trust and follow Jesus is to step out of what's natural and into what is supernatural. There is a life that Jesus calls us to that's, that's bigger than what just comes naturally, what's instinctive, what's from the flesh. It's supernatural. Because this, as natural as it is for us, it's born out of fear. This comes from a place of fear down deep inside. I just want to remind you today, there's a third way. It's not fight. It's not flight. It's a better way. It's the way that you and I were created to experience. It's, 
It's life-giving. It's beautiful. It's God-honoring. The, the one who made us and loves us just as we are, not as we should be, who has plans for us, has purpose for us, he wants to call us out of, us, out of this. And, and the way that he calls us into is love. It's love. It's love over fear. Jesus calls us out of our fear and into his love. Now, to be real clear, it's not easy. This, is, this sounds so simple. It's not, it's not this touchy-feely love that you might be think I, I think I'm talking about. It's not something you stick on a Hallmark card. No. No, this third way, it's the most difficult thing you or I will ever do in this life. I am convinced of this. Let, let's go right to the words of Jesus, if you will. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Um, we're going to look at the words of Jesus. I think, this is my personal opinion, this is the most difficult passage for me in all of Scripture. How's that for a teaser before we read it? This, these are the most difficult words that I think Jesus has ever said to me. Um, let's read it together. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43. Jesus says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Whew, that is a doozy of a paragraph in the middle of a long teaching that Jesus gave a couple thousand years ago. I, I want to point out a couple of things. This last line, you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I think this is a little misleading, a little confusing, and I want to, I want to clarify for you. I'm no Greek scholar, but I do know that the original Greek language that's translated different ways for us into English this word perfect doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean what I thought it meant when I first read it. It doesn't mean flawless. Okay, God is saying you, I, we need to be perfect, without blemish, without flaw, just like God is. No, that's not what he's saying. A better understanding for us in the way we use words is mature or whole, W-H-O-L-E, or complete. God wants to grow us up. We've talked about this a lot the last couple of years. God wants us to start far from him, disconnected from him, in rebellion. We come to him because of the work of Jesus, because of forgiveness of sin, because of opportunity to trust him and follow him. We start this life with Jesus, but he wants to move us along, which is not about time. It's about spiritual maturity. It's about growth. It's about change from the inside out. It's about our character changing. He wants to mature us. And so when it says be perfect, be, be perfect, it doesn't mean don't mess up. Don't mess up at all. No, it means continue to grow, continue to be maturing, continue to be approaching maturity. That's what this means. Other thing I want to point out is really the heart of this paragraph, this difficult instruction from Jesus is when he says, love your enemies. That's the heart behind this. I want you to love your enemies. I'm not sure it gets any more difficult than anything else we're considering trying to do obediently as Christians. On one hand, we look at something like this and we go, that's beautiful. That's awesome. Uh, wouldn't it be great if everybody lived that way? <laughs> wouldn't the world be a better place if everybody was not just kind to their friends, but kind to everyone? That didn't just love the people who were lovable, but loved their enemies as well. Wouldn't our relationships be better? I mean, it sounds really good. But on the other hand, if I could be this honest this morning, I think this teaching of Jesus also seems dumb. It seems foolish. Because loving people is really hard. I'm not talking about being nice. I'm not talking about being friendly. We do that really well in Texas. No, loving people, sacrificially giving of ourselves to people, denying what we want and making what they want first, that's love. Loving people is really hard. Loving annoying people is especially really hard. Am I right? Can I get an amen from the couch? Yes. Loving your enemy? Really? 
Well, let's get some context for when and where and to whom Jesus said these crazy words. Let's think about this. This is first century Israel. So the first century Jews who were listening to Jesus talk, who were listening to this paragraph being in the middle of a long sermon that Jesus was giving, they knew exactly who the enemy Jesus was referring to. It was the Romans, it was the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had occupied Israel at that point for generations. The Roman Empire uh, took what they wanted, when they wanted, from the Jews. They took their money, they, they excessively taxed the Jewish people, they treated them poorly. I mean, the Romans were all about justice and order, but that was if you're a Roman citizen. If you're a Jew or anybody else, you were a second, third, fourth class citizen, and you, you did not experience justice at all, fairness at all. No, um, on top of all that, there's no sign of them leaving anytime soon. This is what people in that first century grew up knowing. They had no reason to think that's going to change anytime soon. It was overwhelmingly oppressive. So when Jesus talked about loving their enemies, this was not some hypothetical. This is not some, you know, Bible study class where, you know, if this hypothetical situation came about. No, they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Talking about loving enemies, talking about the Romans. Other religions, by the way, I think this is important to point out. Other religions do talk about loving other people. They do talk about loving your neighbors, for example. Other religions do talk about extending forgiveness to neighbors who have wronged us. But Jesus is the only one who goes so far as to say, love your enemy. Jesus is the only one to go that far. Which actually makes sense to me when I realize how far God has gone for us. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 5. Just one line I want to read out of Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Paul says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still enemies. There's a lot to unpack there in this short little verse, but a few things jump out to me. First of all, the word friendship. This is the heart of Christianity especially for those of y'all that that are still trying to figure out what Christianity is. It's not a voting block. It's not some separatist tribe. It's not even just some religious group. Christianity at the heart is about friendship because we believe that God created us relational beings, created us to have friendship with each other, unique, healthy, deep friendship with other people, and, and friendship with the one who made us. He's not just some abstract idea. He's not just the force like Star Wars or something else weird. No, he's a personal, interpersonal, interactive being that he wants us to have friendship. So this, this word friendship is really important here when Paul writes it. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. That's another piece of this. It was broken. We rebelled. We didn't choose friendship. We chose independence. Texas, we like our independence. Americans, we like our independence, right? Well, when it came to us with God, independence is bad. Uh, We chose to rebel. We chose to do our own thing, be our own king. And instead of submitting, surrendering to the one who loves us perfectly. And so that, that friendship was broken. But the good news, this is the gospel. The good news of Jesus is that by going to the cross, by dying and taking on our sin on himself, he paid the price to restore friendship, to restore friendship with him. When did this happen? While we were still his enemies. Don't miss this today. Did this happen when we came back groveling, asking for forgiveness? Nope, happened before that. Did this happen when we just had a change of heart and decided, you know what, I think I do want to trust God? Nope, happened before that. This happened. The good news took place. Jesus went to the cross while we were still his enemies, while we still had our back turned toward him, while we had already given him the finger and gone the opposite direction, say, I want to live for me. That's when Jesus paid the price to restore our friendship with God. This is the good news. We think Jesus takes it too far when he instructs us to love our enemies don't we, if we're honest? But we're okay with how far Jesus took it to restore relationship with us while we were still his enemies. Jesus does take it too far. Praise God, Jesus takes it too far. 
God loves us and likes us even when we don't love him or like him. What what were his words from that passage we just read? If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Jesus taught this and he lived it. He lived it. He proved his love for us. God loves and likes us even when we don't love or like him. When our backs are turned to him, he still loves us. When we're unfaithful, he is still faithful. Can, can we just stop for a second? I just, I just want to thank him. Even if we don't talk about anything else, even if we, we tune out and don't, don't catch anything else this morning. God, thank you for your good news. Thank you for loving us while we were still your enemies, while we still lived just for us and were selfish and self-absorbed and apathetic. Thank you for being faithful before we even thought of you. Thank you for that. Thank you for making a way home. Thank you for restoring friendship. Lord, for anybody right now who's just convicted of that, just that blessing you have extended to us, that, that life you have offered to us, and they just want to pursue you, want to respond to you, maybe for the first time ever, would you meet them right where they are right now? As they pray, as they just in their own mind, in their own heart, right now just say, I want to love you back. I want to give my life back to you. Would you receive them? Would you help us walk with them and encourage them? Uh, thank you for the way you did that for me about 30 years ago. Thank you for the way everything changed when I came back home to you because of the work you'd done to restore friendship. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Well, moving along in our teaching, can we just recognize, can we just recognize together that we're being taught every day, not how to love, but how to hate our enemies. Uh, I think some of us are learning it from our parents. Some of us are learning it from social media. Some of us are learning it from the news. Uh, it's just fear is contagious. Fear of the other, fear of people not like us, people we don't understand, people we just don't like from a distance, uh, fear of people who have hurt us in some way. Uh, it's contagious. I think fear is more contagious than love, if we're pretty honest about it. And then Jesus comes along and doesn't just talk about love. No, that'd be, that'd be one level. No, Jesus comes along and he talks about enemy love enemy love. And I'm sure that his first followers, the first Christians were like, I'm sorry, you want us to do what? Are you kidding me? Love our enemies? There was one moment where Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment. It was recorded by Matthew in Matthew chapter 22. We read this passage a lot in Christian churches. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36. Excuse me. Someone said, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? In the Old Testament law, what's what's the most important commandment? Because there's a lot of commandments. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This is it. This is the one that sums it all up. And they knew what he was talking about. He was quoting the Old Testament from Deuteronomy. Um, any, Any Jews that were listening to him talk, they knew exactly what he was talking about. But then Jesus does what he always does. He, he just shook everything up a little bit, and he added a little surprise, and he quoted a different commandment. It says, a second commandment is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. I love it. I love how Jesus just spices things up. The religious lawyer who asked this question uh, very logically followed up with another question, probably the same question you or I would follow up with, which is, okay, who's my neighbor? You, you said to love your neighbor as yourself. Who do I have to love like I love myself? Would you, would you clarify that for me? And Jesus, as he so often did when someone asked him a question, he told a story. He was such a great teacher. He just told stories left and right. So Jesus tells a story. Some of us are familiar with it. He told a story about two people groups who hated each other. The Jewish people and the Samaritan people, the Jews and the Samaritans. He tells a story about a Jew who was traveling alone, who got attacked and robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. And along comes a Jewish priest. And the Jewish priest did nothing to help. He just kept moving on by. And then along comes a Jewish temple worker. And that Jewish temple worker did nothing to help. He just kept on moving by. And then a Samaritan, the hated enemy, comes along. 
and he stops and he cares for the Jews and he bandages his wounds and he takes him into town for more help. And Jesus turns to the people that he's telling this story to. And he says, which one of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked and robbed and left for dead? If it helps you put yourself back in the crowd listening to this story, maybe instead of us calling it the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, for some of us, we should call it the story of the Good Democrat. Or maybe for others of us, we should call it the story of the Good Republican. Just for the way it, it shakes us up in the way that it shook up Jesus' first listeners. Did you know that Jews hated Samaritans even more than they hated the Romans? Kind of like some Republicans hated President Obama more than they did Osama bin Laden, some of them. Kind of like some Democrats hate President Trump more than they hate Putin or others. Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. Fair question. Who is my neighbor? Well, who do I dislike? Or whose skin color is different than my own? Whose politics drive me absolutely nuts? Whose morals or beliefs make me want to just throw up a little bit? Jesus came along 2,000 years ago and he revealed very tangibly the heart of God. Enemy love. It's crazy. That was 2,000 years ago. Let's go back even farther. About 750 years before Jesus came on the scene, we see this enemy love revealed as the heart of God. Do you know the story of Jonah? I know some of you do. For a lot of us, it's like this children's story. We get this, you know, big, beautiful ocean and this cute, big, giant fish or a whale. And there's Jonah sitting in the belly of the whale. And it's become this bedtime story for a lot of us. Um, maybe even like, how did that even happen? Well, it's actually a story of God telling Jonah to go love his enemies. And Jonah telling God, nope, not going to do it. <laughs> Did you know Jonah's the only prophet recorded in the entire Bible who literally ran in the opposite direction of where God told him to go? He did the opposite of what he was told to do. And there's some pretty crazy things that God asked different prophets to do. I just looked up a few. Hosea, he said, I, I want you to marry a prostitute. And what did Hosea do? He married a prostitute. Uh, Noah, I want you to build a huge ark. And we know what happened. He, he did. Ezekiel, I want you to lie on your side for 390 days, and I want you to eat this scroll. And, and he did. Jonah, I want you to go to the city of Nineveh, and I want you to give the people a message from me to them. And Jonah said, no way. And he got up and he went in the opposite direction. Nineveh's over here. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh and do this for me. And Jonah got up. We can read the first page of the book of Noah. And he ran this way. Why did Jonah freak out and go in the opposite direction? Well, let's dig a little deeper. What was Jonah doing when God told him to go to Nineveh? Nineveh, by the way, which was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. What was Jonah doing in this moment? We can learn, if we read other parts of Scripture, specifically 2 Kings and, and parts of Nahum, we can learn that Jonah at this time was busy building a wall. He was building a wall of protection on the north end of Israel that separated Israel from the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians had already attacked and robbed the Israelites. Uh, we can read again about that in 2 Kings and in Nahum. The Assyrians were brutal enemies of Israel. We know Jonah knew how violent they were. We know he knew history. I think it's fair to say Jonah had experienced, like all of his peers, personal loss of family and friends due to the Assyrian Empire, the violence of the Assyrians. I think it's fair to say he feared the Assyrians. He hated the Assyrians. So here he is building a wall to defend and fight the Assyrians. And God comes along and says, I want you to put down your shovel. I want you to put down your sword, and I want you to go be with them. And Jonah said, no way. And he got up and took off the other direction. 
So even way back 27, 27, 50 years ago, God was revealing his heart of enemy love. The character of God was revealed even long before Jesus comes along with this radical teaching. Stories of Jonah, the stories of the Good Samaritan, um, they're not about sending thoughts and prayers from a distance, are they? No, they're way more uncomfortable than that for us. It's much more up close and personal. Speaking of up close and personal, I recently uh, read about uh, some Barna research that they did on us. It's fascinating what they kind of came up with studying Christians, surveying Christians back in 2018, specifically when it comes to us and friendship. Christians, Barna says, are even more likely not to have friends who are different from them. Whew, that's convicting. Evidently, this research is showing that we love to hang out with each other. We love to befriend each other and don't do a good job of having friends that are different than us. Christians are even more likely not to have friends who are different from them, especially when it comes to religious beliefs. 91%, according to the research, mostly similar. We are becoming friends with people who believe what we believe almost exclusively. Christians are even more likely not to have friends who are different from them, especially when it comes to ethnicity. We are becoming friends with people who look like us, who have the same cultural traditions and background as we do, the skin color that we do. 88% of us. Christians are even more likely not to have friends who are different from them, especially when it comes to political views. 86% of us are becoming friends with people that we share the same political views. Now, I get some of that's just natural and downright comfortable and more fun, right? But I really believe this. We're not to live in this separated kind of way. The separation, at the very least, does not lead to growth in us. This growth that we want, we know the Lord wants for us to grow into maturity in Christ's likeness. This separation does not lead to that kind of growth in loving people like God loves people. In contrast to this separation we read about from the Barner research, a lot of us, I think, are nodding our heads going, yeah, that's my experience. I have loved discovering the incredible life story recently of Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis is a black man and a descendant of slaves who tried to love his enemies like Jesus does, like Jesus instructed him to. Uh, he tells the story of being uh, 10 years old and he's carrying a flag with his Cub Scout troop in Massachusetts, and uh, everybody else is white in his troop. He's the only black kid, and um, all of a sudden, he's getting hit by rocks and bottles from some people in the crowd, and immediately, uh, some of the leaders of the Cub Scout troop just come around him and protect him. It's kind of a beautiful moment of them just, you know, getting him out of danger, but in the moment, he says that he just thought, oh, man, there's some people here who don't like Cub Scouts, <laughs> and he didn't realize, no, it's because he was black. He was the only kid getting hit by rocks and bottles. And he had an interesting conversation for the first time ever with his dad about racism. And it was very confusing, he says at 10. I, I don't understand, dad. Why would they hate me if they don't know me? Well, Daryl went on to become an incredible blues musician. He played with Chuck Berry, with B.B. King, with Jerry Lee Lewis. He played with Elvis. Are you kidding me? This guy got to be a really accomplished blues musician. One night he was playing in an all-white bar in Maryland, and he says that uh, one, of the, one of the people that was there, a white guy, of course, comes up to him in between sets and says, man, you're really good. I've never seen a black man play the piano like Jerry Lee Lewis does. And Daryl found a way to tell this guy, uh, well, actually, Jerry Lee Lewis, he learned to play piano from some black blues piano players, some boogie-woogie piano players that are black. In fact, on top of that, Jerry Lee Lewis is a personal friend of mine. And this guy was very skeptical, didn't really believe Daryl, but they, they had a drink together and friendship was formed. It's a very unique experience, as you can imagine. This guy actually goes on to confess to Daryl that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, a white supremacist group. Well, years go by, and Daryl decides he wants to interview 
some KKK members for a book he's writing. So he reaches out to this friend that he's made, and he ends up connecting with a man named Roger Kelly, who was the imperial wizard of the KKK in Maryland. He was fascinated by this, this question that started when he was a kid. Why would they hate me if they don't even know me? Davis befriended over 20 members of the KKK. He claims to have been responsible for somewhere between 40 and 60 Klan members leaving the Klan. Uh, indirectly, over 200 people have said to have left the Klan because of the work, at least in part, of the work of Daryl Davis. Uh, one Klansman told Davis that all black people have a gene in them that makes them violent based on the scientific finding that a gene increases the likelihood of violent activity, which was found to be most prevalent in African Americans. After a time, Daryl says, you know, he, he says to the man, you know, it's a fact that all white people have within them a gene that makes them serial killers. Name me three black serial killers. He could not do it. I said, you have the gene, it's just latent. And he said, well, that's stupid. And I said, it's just as stupid as what you just said to me. <laughs> and Daryl writes that that started a conversation with this man and a friendship that formed. Every time Daryl inspires someone to leave the clan, they give him their clothes. They give them their, their uniform, their robe, their, ma their, their hood, their mask. Uh, and if you, if you just want to look at Daryl Davis on YouTube, you will find some fascinating stories he has to tell tons of outfits of KKK members whose lives Daryl saw changed because of his love for his enemy. What does Daryl do with his enemies? Does he fight? Does he hurl insults? Does he get into shouting matches with them? Does he post things on social media? Does he comment in their social media feeds? No. What does Daryl do with his enemies? Does he just avoid them at all costs? I'm going to stay in my little, my little black world. You stay in your white supremacist world, and we're just going to pretend it's not real, and I'm just going to keep my distance? No. No, what does Daryl do? Daryl sits down with them. He eats with them. He shares a drink with them. Daryl's kind to them. He asks questions. He listens. Dare I say it, he actually shows affection to them. And he blows their minds. <laughs> Some of their lives are changed. I think Daryl embodies the famous words of Martin Luther King Jr., who was a famous Baptist pastor who was captured by the love of Jesus, who said these words. Some of us have heard them. He said, I'm convinced that men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. And they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other. And they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. We talked about this last week. Satan is all about dividing and categorizing and separating. And God is all about uniting. He's all about oneness. He's all about togetherness. True to his nature, Jesus instructs you and me to love our enemies. This is how we live this out, love over fear. I want to finish this morning with a couple of questions, and, and I want you to grab a pencil and a piece of paper, use your phone, grab your laptop. Uh, I, I want you to take a moment, please do this, just a tangible exercise. I want you to answer a couple of questions. If you've got your kids with you, do it with your kids right now, okay? Uh, if you're watching it later, maybe you can pause it, you can come back, but right now, just stay live with me. I want to ask you these questions. Are you ready? Be honest. Who is your enemy? Ask your kids, who is your enemy? Ask your spouse. Be honest with yourself. Who is your enemy? Let's get a little more tangible. Who have you been attacking? I mean, social media comes to mind, but there's other ways we can verbally spar, we can aggressively attack people we agree, disagree with. Who have you been guilty of attacking? Be honest. Who have you been running 
or staying away from. This is the one for me. I am convicted. I've got a couple family members even uh, who I have unfollowed on Facebook. I have just, I've had my fill with uh, some of the things they say, some of the things that trouble me, uh, maybe just annoy me, irritate me. And I am convicted this week that that's not loving my enemies. That's not loving people I disagree with, people that bug me. No, I do get there's a time and a place to just take a chill pill and avoid some of that mess. Um, I'm not saying all of us should follow everybody on Facebook that drives us crazy. I'm just saying, for me, I'm convicted. I need to really wrestle with how God wants me to love them well. Love them like Jesus. And I don't think it's avoiding them. I don't think it's running away. How will you respond to Jesus? Isn't that the question? We read that paragraph from Matthew 5. Love your enemies. Be kind, not just to your friends but to your enemies. Love the people, not just whom are lovable, but who are your enemies, who drive you nuts, who are on the other side of the aisle, who, who disagree with so many things you disagree. Who are you going to love well like Jesus wants you to? Let's pray together. Father, I just trust you have spoken um, to a bunch of us today because I just know how uncomfortable this is. I know how hard it is to hear. I, it's just coming... All together for me, even as I wrestle with what to teach each week, that you are convicting me that the way you call us to is the narrow way. It's not the wide open, easy way. The life you invite us to live, the full life, the rich, beautiful life that honors you, it's the hard way. And, and I know this is central to what you teach us, Father. Would you please help us? Lord, we fix our eyes on Jesus time and time again when I get confused, when I get uh, mired in the complexity of even Scripture and the, the many things we're called to do and to be. I just come back to you, Jesus. You are the one I want to keep my eyes on. You are the one I want to pray to. You are the one I want to I live my life in, in reflection of. I want to be more like you. I want to, I want to trust you more. So, Lord, we, we just fix our eyes on you, Jesus. We trust that if we do that, you're going to make enemy love happen. You're going to make change in us happen. We love you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. We pray this and we sing about you right now. We sing about you, Jesus, right now. Hear our prayers. Hear our praise.